I would request uh, all the oral presenters to kindly come to the center table on the first row. It is an honor to introduce Professor Sham Sundar, the chair of this session. He is a professor of medicine at the Institute of Medical Sciences, Banaras Hindu University. He did his MBBS at this institute in 1976 and MD in medicine from the same institute in 1981. He is the honorary chief investigator at, Ka at Kala Azar Medical Research Center, Muzaffarpur. He is a recipient of several prestigious awards and has co-authored textbooks such as Davidson's and Harrison's Principles and Practice of Medicine, 20th edition, and Kahn's Current Therapy, 2002. He is a reviewer on several scientific journals and has been a member of several working groups and an advisor to WHO for the CRO region. Currently, he is working on five ongoing projects on visual leishmaniasis and Kala Azar. We welcome you, sir. The, I, it's an honor to introduce uh, the co-chair for this session, Professor Hamid Sahibi. He is a professor of parasitology at the Pathology and Veterinary Health Public Health Department. He holds a DMV degree from Morocco, a master's degree from the Medical University of Messina, Italy, on parasitic zoonosis in the Mediterranean region. He is also holding a PhD in immunoparasitology from Ohio State University. He is a leader of several projects on animal health and public health, author of several scientific papers on tick and tick bone diseases, leishmaniasis. We welcome you, sir. So now I hand over the session to the chair and co-chair and request all the presenters to be ready. Good morning. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to chair the session uh, along with my co-chair, Professor Sahibi. Uh, the rules will be that uh, the presenters will be given 15 minutes to present and then five minutes for discussion. Uh, with this, I invite Ms. Ankita Chaurasia. Uh, she is a doctoral fellow at the Manas Hindu University, and she will be presenting latent infection with L. Donovan in highly endemic villages in Bihar, India. So, Ankita. Good morning, everyone. Um, my topic of presentation is latent infection with Lismania donevani in highly endemic villages in Bihar, India. Let's start with a brief introduction. Vistal Lismaniasis, also known as Kala Azar, is a chronic infectious disease and it is fatal if left untreated. It's a vector-borne disease caused by parasites of Lismania species, Lismania infantum and Lismania donevani. And if we consider Indian subcontinent, causative parasite is Lishmania donovani, and it is anthroponosis transmitted by the bite of female phlebotomus as antipus sandflies. Estimated annual incidence is 20 lakhs to 40 lakhs, and the ratio of clinical to subclinical infection is 1 in 4 to 10. Objectives of our study was to assess the trends with age in the probability of being seropositive or seroconverting for two serological markers of visceral leishmaniasis among asymptomatic residents of high incidence villages. And uh, second was comparison of titers among asymptomatic seropositives with those of known recent VL cases. To achieve our goal, uh, we uh, selected 11 high uh, VL in incidence villages in Mujaffarpur district of Bihar, having a population of 19,886. All inhabitants uh, above age of two years were included in our study. We conducted uh, two house-to-house -house surveys uh, uh, in one, one year interval, and a blood sample was collected on filter paper. We, uh, we applied direct agglutination test and RK39 ELISA as serological markers for infection. The threshold value for that positivity was uh, 1 is to 1,600, uh, and for RK39 ELISA, it was uh, greater than or equal to 14% point positivity. 
a person, a subject who, uh, who was negative on both essays in first round and became positive on either essay in round two was considered as zero converter. But uh, there should be uh, increase of two titles in that, uh, that positivity. And for RK39 Eliza, it was, uh, it, there should be an increase of 3% point positivity to become a zero converter. We enrolled 13,163 uh, subjects, uh, and uh, out of them, 529 were ex-VL cases, so we uh, excluded uh, them from uh, first round of analysis. We found 6.2% uh, DAD positive, 5.9% were RK39 ELISA positive, and 259 subjects were DAD and RK39 both positives. And the agreement between the two essays was uh, uh, very weak with a kappa value of 0.3. From this graph, we can, uh, we can see that uh, the dead titers of uh, subjects uh, at uh, subje peak of uh, four, uh, 1 is to 400 uh, and, uh, a much, uh, and a second lower peak with a much higher titer of 25,600 was uh, observed. And in case of uh, RK39 ELISA, uh, absorbance of optical density was uh, um, with a high peak at 7% uh, point positivity. To assess the trends with A's uh, for uh, uh, being zero positive with uh, DAT and RK39 ELISA, we uh, sub subdivided our A's study population in eight subgroups. And we found that uh, probability of being uh, zero positive with DAT and ELISA increases with age. Same, similar find, uh, finding was observed in case of RK39 ELISA also. Now results uh, of round two, stability of serological status. Uh, as, we, as I have shown in my earlier uh, slide that we selected 13,163 um, subjects in our first round and from them 9,873 uh, were zero negative. And from f first round uh, zero survey and second round zero survey, we, uh, uh, two uh, incident VL cases were uh, documented. 351 uh, subjects so, uh, showed zero converters, like 233 from uh, DAT and 134 from uh, RK39 ELISA were reported at zero converters. 16 subjects were uh, uh, converter from both the essays. As uh, uh, I have shown in my uh, earlier uh, slide that uh, 741 uh, subjects were RK39 ELISA positive in round one, and out of them, 626 uh, subjects were sa also sampled in round two, out of which uh, 372 had reverted back to zero negative status. That is 59% uh, were zero negative, and in case of that, 33% were uh, reverted back to uh, negative status. If we consider zero conversion, uh, trends of zero conversion with age, we, uh, we observed that uh, probability of being zero converter also increases with age. We modeled uh, that uh, and RK39 ELISA positivity and probability of uh, VL and uh, active VL and zero con converter uh, against age. And we observed that uh, probability of uh, VL or active VL is, uh, was highest at the age of 25 years and uh, it, uh, it, de it declined very steeply uh, beyond that age. And for, RK and for that and RK39 ELISA positivity and and for zero converter, trends is increasing with age. Like for um, zero converter, uh, beyond age, um, it increases till age 59. For RK39 ELISA, till 67 years. And for that, uh, beyond the age of 70 years, uh, probability of uh, zero positivity is increasing. Um, in our study population, one, uh, 118 subjects were uh, ex-VL cases, and we observed, uh, we also observed that uh, the titers of uh, uh, DAT and RK39 ELISA positivity among uh, recent ex-VL cases were much higher, uh, in, uh, much higher than asymptomatic seropositives. We can see that. Uh, 
that uh, positivity uh, was uh, that titer was uh, greater than 25600 and rk39 was 33 pp in uh, while uh, for asymptomatic zero positives it uh, that titer was 1 is to 6400 and rk39 was 19 pp however uh, as the uh, delay in years between bl episode and zero survey approaches we see that uh, that titer remain uh, fairly stable uh, during uh, whole period but the rk39 li uh, absorbance was uh, declining with time and uh, after two and half years of disease uh, episode and zero survey uh, rk39 titer had fallen a level uh, like a symptomatic zero positive that is almost 19 percent positivity the main findings was uh, probability of being zero positive increases with age probability of zero converting also increases with age x vl cases have higher titers than zero positive asymptomatics and uh, clinical vl affects mainly children or young adults possible explanations uh, we can infection with l don one is permanent but antibody titers fluctuate Uh, asymptomatic zero positive have uh, relatively low antibody titers and uh, we can say that uh, as the people get older their probability of having been infect ever ever been infected increase so upon renew exposure uh, they have a great uh, more tendency to become zero positive and uh, one more possible explanation is the intermittent release of parasites contained in the safe target cell Uh, upon and uh, they uh, become uh, they release from the those target cell occasionally and uh, then uh, they may uh, trigger an immune response then i would like to thank uh, professor sham sundar professor malin malin bolat and uh, dr ipko haskar and other my other colleagues and uh, this work was supported by nis tmrc grant thank you thank you ankita so what do you think uh, do you what is the importance of this zero positives i can understand there are two things one either it predisposes these people to have a greater chance of being over disease and second they all there is a hazard of being zero positive and healthy so that when you have malaria or some other fever somebody does a k39 and you are positive then you may be treated for vl so what do you think what is your opinion so can you please explain question huh? can you please repeat the question what is the importance of being zero positive in uh, in the field like so so uh, these zero positive may be a reservoir for uh, for disease progression what is progression okay anyway now i invite question from the audience coach sir you give you give us three explanation which one is the you think is the the um possible explanation yeah. uh so uh, boosting effect on re exposure as the people get re exposed again and again they always have antibodies against uh, leishmania donovani in their blood so when we uh, uh, test them they will always be uh, zero positive for dat and rk39 elisa <coughs> serological markers Doc, dr rijal uh, thank you for a very nice and clear presentation uh, this is a question which uh, you know we use the dat and the rk39 for diagnosis of uh, clinical vl and it has a very high sensitivity and specificity but uh, <clears throat> you we see that there is no um, there is not much agreement between these two test when you are looking at asymptomatics so do you think uh, what do you think is the reason behind this and could it be that uh, our tools are not good enough to detect asymptomatics because if we have a very high sensitivity for clinical vl and specificity why are we missing it on that and getting it in rk39 and vice versa so do you think there is an, any explanation for this so like that uh, in that we use whole promestigot 
for agglutination test. But in RK39, ELISA, we use a particular protein part, 39 amino acid protein. So uh, this is the reason which cause uh, this agreement between the two tests. My question was, but when you do on VL cases, you will have that if a person is positive with that, he is also positive with RK39. There is not, there is very high uh, agreement. But with asymptomatics, you are getting, not getting an agreement. So you understand. What is the explanation in, in, in cases in VL, both the serological tests are positive. In high titers, you have already said that. But in, uh, if you do a serological survey, zero survey, you find that they don't exactly do not overlap. There some are positive with K39, some are positive, positive with that. Uh, that and only few are positive with both. So what is the explanation? Is it the low titer or? Sir, uh, low titers is the main cause of uh, this uh, discrepancy and uh, antibodies titers always fluctuate. So, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ankita, because it was very clear, your presentation. So. It is a very complex matter indeed, eh? because we are puzzled by these antibody responses and we are looking for explanations. So, and the, the question is indeed, um, yeah, do they matter, as you said, do they matter, as, as Prof. Shaim said, do they matter, these asymptomatics, these latent carriers, it's like in tuberculosis, what is the importance of the latent carriership? And in this case, yes, you said, do they matter for progression to clinical disease? That is one, one issue. Do they matter for transmission of the epidemic? Is also another issue. Can they infect other people? Can the sand fly get infected f from healthy asymptomatic carriers? That is also the big question today. But my question to you is because what is not so apparent from your slides, these are huge numbers, but you and your colleague uh, Abhishek did all this work in the laboratory, so you, you know how much work it is. Can you explain a little bit? Because for these epidemiological surveys have another importance for future vaccine studies. Huh? They would, future vaccine studies would also need to, to study in a population that is not sick, huh? if people are protected from a vaccine, and then you would need to do similar work. But can you explain the workload and your experience in the lab with these serological tests? Is yeah. it easy to do or not? Uh, we performed direct agglutination and test in RK39 ELISA, and uh, um, due to day-to-day uh, -day variation, we observed a lot of discrepancy in uh, results also. And uh, for that, we, have to, uh, we had to repeat the test uh, to confirm the result. And um, there were two, people, uh, two other people who also uh, observed the result. And then we finalized the uh, actual result, what, should be, what it should be. They are immune. Huh? They are immune. They are immune. No, they are not immune. Uh, in fact, uh, in some, some of the studies, it has been shown that they are several times more prone to develop the disease. Any more questions? Epco. Just a small addition to what you said, that they are more prone to develop the disease. Actually, we have followed up this cohort for two years now. And so we have seen that those with the high titers have a much higher chance of uh, progressing to disease than those with, who are seronegative, and even much higher than those who are only moderately seropositive. So there is definitely an association. Okay then. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Angita. Thank you. And now I invite uh, Mr. Abhishek Kumar Singh. He is also a doctoral fellow at the Banaras Hindu University.
and he will be presenting uh, high par parasite burden in healthy individual contribute to its progression to VL. Good morning, everyone. Here I am presenting my research topic, high parasite load in healthy asymptomatic individuals in endemic area of visceral ismaniasis. Apart from this study, I am showing uh, some data from uh, different countries. They have shown about the asymptomatic, means they show the ratio of incident asymptomatic infection with Lismania donovani or infantum to symptomatic clinical cases. In Sudanese, they have shown that less number of asymptomatic in comparison to symptomatic cases, 1 is to 2.4, uh, whereas I have uh, in India and Nepal, I found more number, means other country shows that asymptomatic uh, ratio is much higher than sympt symptomatic case, case clinical cases. So, uh, from our study, We have objective to access e PCR can be used as a tool for detection of Lismania infection and as a marker of risk of progression to disease among recent zero converters. In an endemic area of, uh, for visceral Lismaniasis, asymptomatic infection play a crucial role in disease progression. This study described the use of quantitative PCR to know infection status in endemic region. That will give the real picture of infection status in endemic region. And uh, idea about how to, uh, how many individuals are at risk. Uh, this data already presented by my colleagues Ankita about the how to get zero converters from all this population. 19,886 population number. And after, uh, after getting this uh, serological test, we have found that uh, some zero converters, means more converters, uh, among them we have uh, collected blood samples from this zero converter group and zero negative control group. And, and we performed from uh, these individuals quantity, uh, performed in test for qPCR. Uh, uh, for qPCR, we have used primer sequences that is specific for kDNA of Lismania donovani and used as an internal reference, internal reference gene for negative control TNF alpha. We get a standard curve from the Lishmania parasite DNA and uh, form a standard by running different uh, parasite number from 10 power 6 to 0.1 parasite per ml. This is the standard curve that have slope uh, 3.45 and uh, efficiency is 96.775 percent r square 0.98 after comprising uh, from this uh, standard curve we got uh, results from uh, this zero converter and a thousand uh, uh, control groups uh, we found that less than one parasite
less than one parasite from converter groups 149 37% and 28% uh, from control group and negativity from approximately similar 57% and 68% from both group and uh, 1 to 10 parasite range from converter 4.5% and uh, from control group we get 2.7% and in this way 0.2 and 4 and uh, the higher number is 0.7 percent from converter group and 0.1 percent from control group. Among these uh, we got total number of seven progressor to progress to VL in which uh, five from zero negative group, uh, five from zero converter group and two from the control group. Uh, these two lies uh, this less number point less than one. So we have concluded our this uh, data that uh, there is uh, no major difference in qPCR result between the zero negative and zero converter. Only seven, uh, only from uh, only seven out of 1467 subjects progress to clinical VL in which four have the parasite load more than the threshold value that is the five reported in the papers of asymptomatic uh, of symptomatic infections. So, so uh, may, our conclusion that maybe the qPCR can be can uh, QPCR can help us to detect significant parasitemia early, thereby assisting us in recognition of potential progression to disease, leading to early intervention with disease morbidity and mortality and interruption of disease transmission. This can be a good technique uh, in research work to detect parasitemia level in the serological, uh, serologically positive to test. Uh, uh, my knowledge to Professor uh, Shyam Sundar, Matkarai, Professor Mary Wilson, and F. Ko Haskar, and all my colleagues, non teaching and teaching staff. And thank you. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you, uh, what do you think? I mean, one is that one importance is that uh, these uh, QPCR positive, some of them are progressing to uh, VL seven out of say about 500 or so. But what is happening? Uh, what What is the other importance of this uh, big la large chunk of? population who is qPCR positive. Is there any other importance, any other epidemiological importance? Yeah, mm, uh, means uh, this uh, is, uh, infection status shows that uh, that persons uh, infected with Lismania that may be uh, active or maybe uh, the genetic material only, but uh, that can uh, uh, that can, um, are, are there may be a chance to are, spread this disease from are they playing any role in disease transmission yeah yeah maybe this uh, maybe this this is the reason for disease transmission epco I think here again, is it on? Do you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, I think here again we have a, another marker and then uh, if, if the marker is at low levels, I, I think there are probably uh, a lot of people who are going from positive to negative and uh, the other way around. 
whereas only if you look at the really high levels, there seems to be a, a real association with the probability of developing disease. So I think for any marker, what we really need to do now is to to look also at um, infectiousness and then in function of uh, the level of the marker, because I think those with uh, between zero and one, uh, unlikely that they are uh, infectious, but you never know. But I think we really need to do this xenodiagnosis study. Yeah, another interesting uh, finding here, uh, if you see, is that if you look at the seropositives and seronegatives, the proportion of uh, QPCR positive are similar, and the parasite levels are also similar. So I don't know uh, what is the, the, the importance of ser serology now in, uh, uh, in serosurveys we are doing, but with QPCR we are getting a similar data in seronegatives as well as seropositives. And that is a bit, bit uh, confusing me that what is happening, uh, th that is number one. And number two is that this low level of parasitemia, uh, what I think, I mean, although some, someone has to prove it, may, may be playing a role in uh, the disease transmission. Dr. Rizal. Do you think uh, there could be a difference in the timing of, you know, when you get infected by a sand, uh, the sand fly? It could so happen that you would develop parasitemia first and only later on go on to develop antibodies. So could it be that this parasitemia, which is occurring, is because people are getting infected? And, uh, and, and so there is no correlation, much correlation with the, the antibody teeters which you have measured uh, in this Sorry, population. Yes. Could it be something totally dissociated? Yes, that is a possibility. Yes, that will be possible. After uh, parasitemia may develop serological positive. Okay then, we move on. Thank you, okay. Abhishek. Thank you, sir. We'll <laughs> Don't feel inhibited. There is a lot of time to ask questions, so you can ask. So now I invite Professor Murari Lal Das. He is a professor of entomology at uh, BP Koirala Institute of Health Sciences and a very famous entomologist in this part of the world. And uh, he will be uh, presenting replacement of indoor residual spraying to combat visceral leishmaniasis. Uh, good morning. Okay. Uh, topic of my presentation is search for alternatives of indoor residual spraying to control visceral leishmaniasis. So visceral leishmaniasis is a neglected disease transmitted by sand flies. It, it affects the poorest population in Nepal, India, and Bangladesh. In 2005, the three countries agreed to reduce the annual real incidence to one per 10,000. So this is the elimination goal. Yesterday, Dr. Jacobson has told that elimination should be zero at transmission or at incidence. But here, WHO has fixed one per 10,000. So, the favoring factor to eliminate this disease is human beings are the only reservoir host, though we have reported uh, blood of some domestic animals with uh, LD bodies, but the transmission has not been proved yet. Phalebatomus argentifs is the only factor in this region, and VL is concentrated in 109 districts of India, Bangladesh, and Nepal. So towards this set target, vector control will play a significant role. Indoor residual spraying with DET in India and with parathroids in, uh, in Nepal and Bangladesh it has little success for VL control. By R IRS vector control, disease elimination is impossible. 
In uh, completeness, uh, why it is impossible? Because of the incompleteness of surveillance data, recurrent shortage of insecticide, delays in spray, as well as gradual high cost of both insecticides and implementation program are hampering the effectiveness and sustainability of VL vector control efforts. So, we have uh, one study with the objectives to compare the effectiveness of three different types of alternatives of indoor residual spraying and to measure the community acceptance of the intervention. No intervention is successful if it is not accepted by the community. So, the study design was this study was multi center cluster stratified randomized trial with three methods to control vectors. It was conducted from April 2012 to June 2013, and 1,200 households were uh, selected for the study. The study villages were four highly well living villages having 300 households in each village uh, purposefully selected from Morang and Sunsari districts of Nepal. All households in the villages were listed and divided into six clusters. Entomological study was uh, carried out five of the 50 households. Uh, each cluster were randomly selected from entomological activities. Frequency of study was two weeks before intervention, one, three, six, nine, and 12 months after in intervention. The three different types of interventions were indoor durable wall lining containing deltamethrin, second was indoor wall and floor plastering with lime, and third was the impregnation of bed nets which were available with the villagers. So this is the community meeting and explain the objectives of the project, numbering of the house, houses, Sandfly were collected in five randomly selected houses of each cluster for two consecutive nights by CDC light trap. Altogether, 240 light traps were used per month. CDC light traps were kept two inch away from the wall and six inch above the floors. The time period was 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Stratifying the villages, clusters were stratified on the basis of number of sandflies collected in baseline survey. After that, they were randomly allocated to different treatments. Acceptability was studied by using a structured and pre-tested questionnaire one month after the interventions. Data were analyzed by chi-square and odds ratio. So this is the roll of durable wall lining. It is 50 meters roll, and it was cut according to the length and breadth of the room. So for that, first of all, the rooms were measured, and then the piece was cut from this 50 meter roll. So this is fixing of nails on the cap, and, and this is fixing of the uh, IDWL inside the room. After fixing the rooms, uh, this IDWL, the needed places, whether it is a window or racks or worship places, they were cut open for as the need of the villager or household. So this is the lime, making paste of the lime, solution of lime, applying lime. This is application of lime. Though the houses were ornamentally decorated, so you might be thinking that whether they were covered or not. Yes, they were covered because we have done all the intervention inside the rooms, not the outside. So this ornamentation remains as it is. So this is the impregnation of the nets which were owned by the villagers themselves. This is the light trap which were used for collection of the sand flies. So number of households were almost 300 plus in all the four villages. Ratio of male and female were exactly same, around 600, uh, 600, uh, 650 to 800. Population with cots and nets. So you can see the population and the pink color indicates those people who slept on the floor. 
but even though who have slept on the floor they had nets to be used so though people slept on the floor they used the nets so this is the number of sand flies collected using 240 light traps here we can see clearly that IDWL means durable wall lining and ITN were able to reduce the sand fly density very significantly in comparison to control where lime was not significant. But surprisingly you will note that at the study of six months there was no significant reduction. Why, what might be the cause? The cause was indicated by the control. So you can see by the control that only 24 sand flies were collected at the interval of six months. What, what, what might be the reason? The reason was the weather condition and it was the De December. That's why due to cold the sand fly density has declined itself that's why it could not, the interventions could not show their significant effect. Similarly, here in the density of Flavatomus argentives, IDWL and ITN were able to reduce the sand fly, uh, Flavatomus argentives density very significantly, while Lyme was unable to show the, this significance. Side effects. These interventions had side effects, means uh, headache was caused by IDWL in 19 people, itching in 22 people, while by ATN 25 people had headache, itching 22 people, and burning session, sensation in 20 people. So this, these were the side effects caused by the intervention, which remained for a few days, two, three days, and after that it re disappeared itself. So, by, for conclusion, decrease in the number of sand flies and peer dentifs were highly significant by IDWL and ITN in comparison to control till 12 months of use. In odds ratio, it was found that ITNs were able to reduce the sand fly number 2.5 times more than IDWL one year after intervention. Though eight people percent people suffered from side effects of IDWL and ITN, only 4% people do not like the intervention. So I am thankful to UBS for funding the project, Bear Environmental Science for donation of KOTAV to impregnate the bed nets, Vestergaard sent to provide permanent three, BBKS to give him permission to conduct the study and ITM and IPH for giving chance to present the paper. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Das. So in your opinion, what should be the, uh, I mean, you think the ITN should be uh, now uh, with the policy of... Uh, uh, actually, uh, I have mentioned in uh, the introductory part that there are several limitations for uh, using IT, uh, this um, uh, indoor residual spraying. So uh, ITN is the one uh, bec uh, because what happens is that uh, people, if they go outside, even in the forest for cutting grass and uh, woods and other things, they carry this. So ITN might be the thing. But for the result, uh, IDWL giving better results. But even uh, when we discuss with the community uh, for uh, this use of these things, they prefer ITN. Even though scientifically in bioassay, uh, IDWL, durable wall lining gives better results even after 12 months of intervention. But the thing is that it is on the wall. So what happens, those mosquitoes which are coming inside your house, through your window or door, they come directly to your body and they bite. So once they bite and go to take rest, then only they go on the wall and they die there. So what happens, in nature, uh, in the uh, uh, opinion of the villagers, they say that ITN is better than IDWL, but scientifically, by the test of bias, durable wild lining is better than ITN. Any question from the audience, please? Epco? We are having the same people asking questions. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay, thanks, Murari, uh, for interesting presentation. Uh, 
can you just go back to the slide with the results, the first, uh, because it was not not immediately clear to me um, that uh, the durable wall, which was the most effective. Uh, yeah, this is highly significant uh, by IDWL and ITN. Yeah, but, but the, in control, yeah. the sand fly number was collected 572 after 12 months of intervention. In IDWL 301 and ITN 128. Yeah, but there are also major fluctuations anyhow in the numbers of sand flies captured, because control it goes up even. Yes. So there, yeah, there are anyhow big fluctuations. I just wonder. It seems here then that you have reduced the uh, sand fly density by just below 50 percent. But is that enough to have? Uh, an impact on uh, transmission? Uh, actually, this is the reduction, and uh, this is not the study about the transmission. We have not, uh, we had not dissected the sand flies for availability of the parasite. So uh, this point cannot be certainly uh, claimed. Marlene? With your permission. Um, thank you, and most interesting. And um, as uh, we work together on the evaluation of the impact of long-lasting nets on transmission and on, on incidence of disease, we know, in fact, that long-lasting nets, they, they reduce the vector density in the houses. We found that as well in the trial. But that the link, they didn't protect the people there were the same number of um, Kalazar cases in, in, in intervention and controls at the time. So I'm not saying and that you shouldn't uh, distribute bed nets because they have an impact on vector density. But my question to you is, at this stage, what do you, um, how do you translate this for the policy makers? Can they um, now, well, I, 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 for instance, would not say that they can go by a single intervention. I would say, with what we know today, that they still need to carry on with the with the spraying because we we have I, we we know from previous evidence that the transmission continues even with this type of vector density reductions. But I don't know how because you and the vector control program. Uh, you deal with this, so I don't know what conclusion you made in practical terms for the vector control program. Uh, right. Uh, actually, uh, what happens is that if we will uh, talk about the urgentives, then here we can see that uh, the in control there were 482, but in ITN 75 uh, urgentives were only there. So by principally what happens in Nepal that once uh, two cases are reported from any pocket, uh, focal spraying will be immediately there. And uh, after that, there will be subsequent sprays of IRS are there. That's why uh, we cannot show the effects too much uh, of the uh, other interventions. Other limitation of the study is that we cannot study, uh, this uh, type of study cannot be conducted in the villages where uh, cases are there because you are uh, keeping the population or at risk. So even if we will assure that we will give immediate treatment and uh, immediate diagnosis, uh, it is not possible. So we have to uh, depend on the density of the vectors only. If we will consider the density of vectors, well and good, ITN is the best option to have. about a combination of these one uh, or three uh, methods? Yeah, uh, that is the best option. If you are able to combine the intervention methods, that will be better. But we want to reduce the cut, the price of intervention. Means if you will reduce, uh, increase the prices, well and good. So if you will in, uh, integrate two or three methods, better. <clears throat> Uh, one of the, I think what Marlene has said is, uh, uh, you see, 
we do see reduction in sunflower densities, but we don't know whether it translates into decreased infection or disease. So could it be possible that uh, because of, in Nepal you have a strategy of spraying a village only when you have cases, so if it's possible to at least monitor these cohorts for a longer period of time, because the spraying is not necessarily going to occur unless there's a case out there. So it may be possible to monitor these cohorts which are in the endemic foci and to get a, a maybe a collaborative evidence that whether these are really protective against the other regions which are not using these things. So this is, uh, means maybe for one or two years if you collect data on the number of cases which occur in these cohorts. Yes, uh, you are right uh, to point out these things. And this matter is already in discussion because it will uh, affect the finance. Means once it is assisted, then it can be done. The limitation for ITN here in this case is that uh, we have impregnated the bed nets of the villagers. So there are several bed nets which have teared and the efficacy of this cure tab is up to one, uh, one air. So after that, even if we will follow, uh, we cannot get it. But uh, we have in control uh, clusters, we have distributed uh, this permanent three. So we can follow that ITN and this IDWL. Now, the limitation of IDWL is that we have fixed uh, these uh, IDWL on the walls. Now, when we had uh, visited just uh, last month, I had visited after one and uh, one year, six months. So the villagers raised the question whether they should remove uh, these uh, from their walls or not. Because th uh, this uh, lighting festival is the very important festival when they replastered their houses. So I, I said that please remove it, no problem. Replaster your house and once the wall is dry, then please refix it because it is for your uh, purpose and it will help you. Though, even though the project is over after one year, please use it, uh, it is on your uh, choice. So several of them have removed and uh, replaced it again and uh, those who have replaced, we can carry out the study in those houses. Thank you. You're yes. welcome, sir. Now I invite uh, Dr. Aditya Pradum. Um, he is a, he works at the Society for Community Health Awareness and Research and Action, Bangalore, and uh, he will be presenting effectiveness of long-lasting in insecticidal bed nets in reducing domestic. This is the sand flight density. This is the presentation, yes. This is for switching to the next. Uh, hello, good, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a rather long title. Uh, effectiveness of community level distribution of long, last, long lasting insecticidal bed nets in reducing domestic sand flight density in the Indian subcontinent. This is a systematic review that was conducted uh, uh, some time ago. So, uh, just a repetition of what's already been discussed. So visceral leishmaniasis is uh, an important disease in the contiguous parts of India, Nepal, and Bangladesh. Um, incidence, as I calculated, was approximately 25 cases per 10,000 population in the area where the risk is prevalent, and uh, prevalence of 2.5 million cases. The uh, currently used main approaches were uh, indoor residual spraying and case treatment, and this was uh, giving limited success in control of this disease. And uh, Long-lasting insecticidal bed nets uh, may prove uh, in, uh, good in controlling vis visceral leishmaniasis. A uh, couple of reasons are mentioned here is uh, sand flies mainly bite at night time between uh, 9 p.m. and 1 a.m. And also there was uh, evidence previously uh, that untreated bed nets itself help in reducing the number of nighttime bites. So uh, prior to con uh, while conducting the literature review, I looked for uh, relevant previously conducted reviews, so this was one conducted by Austin in 2008. And uh, the main conclusions with respect to long-lasting long insecticidal nets was that um, they were effective in the lab. Uh, Bioassays showed that they were toxic against the sand flies. And also there was some evidence at that point in time on uh, non-experimental studies that were conducted in the Middle East 
uh, which had kind of shown mixed results. Uh, besides that, uh, the conclusion about uh, indoor residual spraying was that it was an effective method, but uh, the impl implementation may have been a bit poor. Uh, the suggestion for uh, long-lasting insecti insecticidal nets was that they may be potential, uh, potentially useful in reducing uh, the number of sand flies at home and community level, and it may be particularly useful uh, with respect to um, more uh, remote areas where this may be endemic. So the methods I used for the systematic review were as follows. Uh, the main concepts for the literature review, for the systematic review, was sand flies, bed nets in uh, Indian subcontinent. The search strategy was mainly built on uh, Embase database, and uh, based on that, the key terms, mesh terms, and subject headings were identified, and the search strategy was developed. The databases searched were Embase, Medline, Global Health, and Cochrane. And uh, the main inclusion criteria were uh, that they had to be controlled trials. The outcome measure had to be with respect to the entomological outcome of uh, reduction in uh, number of sand flies. And uh, the interventions in each of these had to be that uh, they were community level interven uh, interventions of distribution of insecticide treated bed nets. So this is basically uh, what I had done uh, during the search. And eventually I landed with uh, four trials that were relevant and uh, one uh, literature review which I've already presented about. So the systematic review will be mainly be focusing on these four trials that were available at that point in time. Uh, besides that, the US clinical trials registry uh, was checked and uh, uh, for unreported and ongoing studies. Uh, the critical appraisal for these studies was done using the uh, NICE tool which was developed in 2009 and uh, data extraction method also was based on the 2009 uh, NICE guidelines. Uh, the synthesis was done, uh, uh, a narrative synthesis was performed. Uh, the reasons for that I will tell during my discussion. And uh, to facilitate comparison between the outcomes that were reported in these studies, uh, a, a formula was used which was actually used in a couple of the papers. So they basically compared um, the change in the, uh, in the sand fly densities in the intervention areas, pre, uh, post intervention and pre intervention, and in the control areas. And this was used uh, to show the percentage of reduction in sand flies. So the included studies uh, were these. Uh, I think the slide is quite cluttered, so I apologize for that. But uh, uh, hopefully, it's reasonably clear. Uh, so the, the four papers are, uh, are as follows. And uh, in, the first, in the second column, I have mentioned about the design that was used in these studies. The first three papers used cluster randomized uh, controlled trials. Uh, and the fourth study used a, a quasi-experiment, a non-randomized trial. And, uh, they all used insects, in, uh, insecticide treated uh, bed nets. The countries where these were, he, uh, were set, uh, I've also mentioned here. The first study was in Nepal, second was in Nepal and India, third was in uh, Nepal, India and Bangladesh, and the fourth one was based in Bangladesh. The outcome measure was uh, same for all these. They all uh, used count per light trap per night. And uh, I've also indicated in which season these uh, data were collected because that makes a difference in the way we interpret some of these results. And uh, the next column uh, shows the baseline uh, for the, of the counts for both intervention and control areas. And uh, the penultimate column here, it uh, shows the main results that we are concerned with. So it shows the percentage reduction in sand fly densities as reported by each of these studies. Uh, so in the first study, it's 45.6% reduction. Uh, second one, 31.9, uh, 43.7 in the third, and uh, 59.7 in the last one. Uh, three of the studies have also re uh, reported the uh, associated p-values with these studies. Uh, secondary findings from two of these papers were uh, on the alternative uh, interventions uh, to the insecticide-treated bed nets. The two other interventions that were reported were indoor residual spraying and uh, ecological vector management which mainly includes uh, using lime and mud to uh, uh, block the crevices in which the insects uh, may be proliferating, uh, the vector may be proliferating. Uh, so here we see that uh, the, the LLIN column is basically showing the results for the uh, uh, insecticide-treated bed nets. The penultimate column shows it for the indoor residual spraying and the last one for ecological west vector management. Uh, so based on this, we can see that all three of them have shown reduction in number of uh, uh, sand flight density, in the sand flight density. And uh, 
insect uh, indoor residual spraying is showing relatively more and uh, ecological vector management is showing relatively less compared to uh, uh, long lasting insecticidal nets but if you look at the confidence intervals you see that there is some degree of overlap uh, uh, between each of these and uh, especially in the first study in the second study we see that there's a clear uh, uh, increase a, a clear difference between insecticidal nets and uh, indoor residual spraying some other secondary results were that uh, one study mentioned that uh, peridomestic sandfly densities had also reduced with the uh, insecticide uh, treated uh, bed nets which is important because it means that the the sand flies were not being displaced from inside the house to outside the house they were actually being uh, reduced or killed uh, another uh, secondary result that uh, was noted was that more than 50% of the community perceived this intervention as useful even 6 months after the uh, distribution of bed nets and uh, the third point is that the effectiveness of the bed nets with respect to uh, their uh, uh, ability to kill the sand flies was found to be over 80% 5 months and even 18 months post intervention uh, so these are the main discussion points so uh, the direction of the results were unanimous with respect to reduction in sand fly density so if you look at the averages of all the study it's between 31.9 to 50 59.7% reduction but based on the confidence interval we can say it's between 12.6 and 61.6% reduction in all these areas uh indoor residual spraying may be more effective and uh, ecological vector management little less effective but there is these results were not found to be consistent across the studies one of the main reasons why uh, these results were not uh, pulled together in the form of a meta analysis because a lot of heterogeneity was found in the results and the variations were mainly seen with respect to the site at which the studies were conducted uh, the seasons during which the data was collected and the year uh, during which the data was collected and the outcome measures also were slightly different uh, one study reported it in geometric mean and the other ones in arithmetic mean uh, this is just a figure from one of the studies which shows the variation in each month of the study uh, in each month uh, of the year uh, the levels of the vectors actually change quite uh, you can say quite a lot with each month so that's one of the reasons where some of these variations were seen uh, so strengths of the included studies was that uh, Uh, the all the studies were of acceptable quality and uh, there was no conflict of interest and uh, they used an objective method to uh, 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 test this question the some of the biases in the included studies were that there was inadequate detail on the randomization process and allocation concealment or blinding but the power of the studies uh, uh, appeared to be adequate for uh, testing what was being uh, measured uh, contamination was possible in two of the studies due to the small intercluster distance Uh, okay this is some of the weaknesses of the uh, review which i have performed uh, of course only one reviewer performed this so uh, uh, usually it's good if more than one reviewer participates to reduce any kind of error that has occurred um, only one register was checked uh, also because of access uh, cray literature and uh, unpublished reports were not included uh, due to time constraints i was not able to contact the authors for certain questions i had about the process of the uh, process in the way the study was conducted uh, quality appraisal was performed using just one tool uh, and also uh, heterogeneity may have been explored to a greater extent but it was not done mainly because of uh, lack of time uh, final slide uh, from a public health perspective uh, at first level we talk about impact of uh, uh, bed nets insecticide treated bed nets on a uh, reduction in uh, sand fly density which is an entomological outcome but from an epidemiological perspective one study which was available at the time when i did the review it uh, showed that there was uh, no additional impact on visceral leishmaniasis incidents due to the intervention of the uh, insecticide treated bed nets though they found a 25% or so reduction in the sand fly density uh, but they also suggested that there may be some area specific uh, issues that had come up and there is a need for follow up studies in other settings also some of the other health and environmental impacts that may be considered are in one of the studies which did uh, the follow up they said that there was also reduction in malaria uh, in the intervention areas where the uh, insecticide treated bed nets were used also uh, indoor residual spraying uses uh, synthetic pyrethroids which may have their own effects on health and environment and uh, 
there's potential for uh, insecticide treated bed nets to reduce the dosage of uh, the indoor residual spring potentially. Uh, the third uh, important thing is that the public had perceived this intervention as useful. I mean, at least 50% of the public had perceived this as useful. So that might be a matter that's worth considering. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aditya. <clears throat> what do you think? Uh, in most of the studies that you have presented, there has been a consistent uh, decline in the number of, um, you know, uh, sand flies. Yeah. However, in one study, which uh, we were also part of their study, yes. uh, there was no, di no, it did not translate into the uh, number of real cases. So what is your hypothesis? What do you think is the, is the reason? Uh, some of the reasons that they suggested was that though there's a reduction in sand fly density, the kind of risk that the person is exposed to with respect to transmission, it may not be cu cutting out all the risks. For example, if the person is actually walking out at night, uh, maybe though he has these bed nets at home, once he gets out of the house, the person is exposed. So uh, that may be one of the reasons. Second reason that they say is that, okay, you have a 25% reduction on an average, but maybe that uh, reduction is not adequately correlating with the reduction in risk. Those are the redu reduction in uh, uh, sand fly density. Uh, but thirdly, when you look at some of the individual uh, differences between these studies, in some areas you see huge reduction actually. You see even up to, I don't know, one of these areas they have reported a 298% reduction. Uh, mainly uh, seeking to say that the control areas there was a huge increase and in the uh, intervention areas there was a huge decrease. So it's come up in that way. Uh, so I, I, because there are these variations within areas, I don't know, there might be something to do with area-specific issues also, which we'll need to explore, I guess. Is it region-specific uh, specific to Indian subcontinent? Or because in other, some of the other studies coming from Africa, it has been shown to the, 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 uh, it translate into the number of cases as well. Oh, OK. OK. So. This particular review, I've only focused on India, so I was not aware of uh, well, from the result it, that it was... India, there is only one study, there is no... Yeah. Marley. Thank you. Yes, that study from East Africa was an, <clears throat> an analysis of data from obtained by MSF in a, in a routine distribution program, so it was not a randomized trial, but there they saw indeed um, a reduction in cases based on an, evalu an evaluation of their program. But there, okay, so this is, this is uh, a very nice example of evaluation of complex interventions, which we will be going to discuss uh, later in the next session, how to do this. Because I, I liked very much, thank you for uh, your review. Um, as you see, many of the people who, who did these studies actually are in the room, so they are the ones who collected <laughs> the data, and, it's, and you, you reported it, it very well. But it's clear, on an endpoint of vector density, you see a reduction, and we all agree about that. But I would slightly disagree with your interpretation when you say that, uh, I, I, when you look at your data, you see clearly that IRS gives the highest reduction, 70% uh, reduction in density in, yes. in the two studies. And it's not inconsistent across the four studies. It's because yes. the study design was different. And the, the, the other studies did not look at IRS. Yeah. So maybe if they had looked at IRS in a comparative head-on comparison, they might have seen it also. So that is a, slight, a slight, uh, slightly yeah. different formulation of what I would say. Okay. That is, we, we know that IRS and, and Murari thus said it is the most effective and in reducing vector densities. So where do we go from there? What I wanted to add, what you said, the area specific aspects, the difficulty of these randomized control trials to evaluate effectiveness is you cannot take away what people are already doing to protect themselves. And in this randomized control trial conducted in Nepal and in India, so there were very high coverages by untreated nets. So in the control villages, the families, they had bought themselves yes. on the market a plain, a plain nets, yes. and, and they confer a protection. Yes. So that made it very difficult, in fact, to explain the results of this study, because this was an effectiveness study 
for the program. It does not say that bed net, an, an insecticide treated net, protects an individual compared to using no nets. And that was also clearly shown in the data. Yes, yes. If you make the comparison to using no nets, well, then it's very clear. You rather sleep under a net than sleeping without a net. Yes. And so, but the question asked in the trial was, does it make sense for the program to, to shift to uh, long-lasting net distribution, yes or no, compared to what is now going on in, in that area? And that was what was there. The control situation was routine spraying, IRS, and people using untreated nets. So the real life situation. Okay, so sorry that the story is very long, but indeed, um, yesterday, uh, <coughs> Freddy Sangoba said, randomized control trials, they wipe out all the, <laughs> the difficult things. But this, this, this requires a lot of knowledge about context to understand what the results mean. And so yeah. I need to, to explain. Yeah. So the, okay, so if you, we, that's the situation, huh? Is the, it, that's correct. So we, we compare to the real life situation. Yes. And then the important t message that we, we did not see a protection, okay? It didn't make a difference in terms There's of no cases of Kalazer. But yes. it made a difference in, in terms of malaria because we also yes. looked at malaria. Yes. So our, our interpretation for the program was, Yes, you should distribute long-lasting insecticide-treated nets because they protect people's lives from malaria, malaria, which is already well known, but we were in fact surprised that, we, that in this area, malaria, we, we, we assumed it was a low transmission, but yes. no, it made a difference. So they should distribute long-lasting nets. But again, the, what we said based on our results, you cannot rely on this to achieve a sustainable reduction of transmission yes. as a standalone intervention. So please continue your IRS and add it on, on your existing IRS. Yes. But I liked very much uh, what the discussion, what Murari said, what you said. Maybe, yeah, the thinking now should be about combined and integrated vector control interventions. And maybe there is a way to have a large, long-lasting net distribution and then have the focal spraying to those households where there are cases. So that would reduce the insecticide uh, and the cost of the yeah. spraying things. But those, that is now the thinking in combined vector control interventions. And I learned also from Mr. Kalra, which is a friend of Professor Shaim Sunda, he invited a very senior entomologist who was involved in the malaria eradication campaigns in the past. And he said, be aware because this sandfly is by origin a forest species and it adapts, it has adapted to a periodomestic environment. So it might have adapted to the repeated DDT spraying cycles yeah. and it might be now indeed that the risk is equally outdoors as indoors, as you said as well. So we, we, it is very complex because of the human behavior and it is very complex because the sandfly is a biological species with a, a, bio, a behavior that is also adaptive. Yeah. So that's, well, anyway, I'll stop here. <laughs> Enough complexities. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Vilya Zap from Thailand. Uh, we don't have uh, this problem of VL, but I think a methodological point of view is that uh, we uh, in the analysis, we should not look at uh, individual protection uh, based on whether the household use or not use uh, the, the bed nets or the spray per se, because we have to look at the externalities. For example, uh, if uh, the person is infective and live in the household with spray, he may he or she may not spread the disease. The protection of the individuals is not just based on his household being spray or being put on bed nets, but depend on the other people's household. In uh, whether the other people's household, especially the infected persons, sleep in the bed nets or have uh, stay in the house. Uh, 
the spray out. So methodologically speaking, you have to have the multi-level analysis. So the effect that you look, the, the effect is not just look at the individual's uh, exposures to their own house, but look at where they stay. In the cluster randomized trials, you have to measure the coverage and use that coverage uh, as the determinants of the outcomes. I, I think uh, that, that's important for epidemiologists, not, not just, not just the, not just the uh, random effect per se, but you have to look at the second variable, which is the contextuals. That's my general comments in, in this kind of, of uh, randomized control trials, especially in infectious disease. It's not depend on you, but depend on the others. Yes, uh, I'm the Dr. Tho Sujanta from Cambodia. I was interested in uh, your presentation. At the end, your result, you say so you cannot uh, conclude whether it is a reduction or not about the incident rates because uh, your study is too short. So my question, and how long is it in order to uh, conclude uh, the incident can reduce, uh, significantly reduce by your use of the two sides, uh, IOS and uh, insecticide treatment. Then. This is one question. And another comment. I'm sorry, could you please repeat that? It was not clear actually. One question. The first question is incident reduction. Incident. Yeah, you say that is a short time for your study, so you cannot conclude whether impact to reduction or not. So my question, how long it can be concluded? In your, in your situation like that. One more comment. Okay, according to your show, you already have IOS and also insecticide treated bed net. Most of these are good protect indoor. Really because of your vector, the buy mostly at night. My question, it looks like the same his question. He says, uh, important thing for the infected people. When they go outside, they may need to be beaten by the sunflies. And that's one can spread all this uh, in area. So, if possible, may I suggest that you can uh, add more the repellent? Because repellent is also important when somebody goes anywhere. Is it uh, in your mind or not? Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm, I hope I've understood the questions uh, correctly. I'm sorry. Uh, you can just let me know if, it's, if my answer is uh, clear. Uh, your first question was related to the incidents. Uh, that was one paper which I had reported, uh, which was published in 2010. So uh, they have followed up this, uh, they had followed up their uh, intervention areas for an appropriate period of time and had reported based on that. So uh, I think that the time that they had used for uh, assessing their intervention was adequate. It's that I, I, the time constraint which I had mentioned was mainly related to the review that I had performed. So um, I don't know if that answers your first question. And uh, your second question was related to using, using repellent when they step outside the house. Yeah, I, I think uh, that most of these interventions are mainly looking at protection within the household so uh, I think there is there is a role for looking at some kind of intervention for people who step outside the household as well um, yeah. Sorry. Uh, actually uh, I want to like to just make a comment and maybe somebody has uh, answers maybe uh, who is maybe Murari would know because we have always been saying that uh, okay IRS is difficult it works but it's difficult we want to replace it with uh, something like LLIN or, or a wall lining. But then, for example, in Nepal, we are using the pyrethinoids for both the interventions. And we have also seen reports, you know, scattered reports of insecticide resistance to sand flies. So do you think we will be causing risk if we start using pyrethinoids both for the uh, bed nets and also pyrethinoids for the IRS? Uh, 
Uh, actually, uh, 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 this parathroid, due to use of parathroids, uh, they might uh, develop resistance, the vectors. Uh, but the thing is that uh, we shift from one kind to another kind uh, in Nepal. So uh, we change the uh, insecticide every three years. Only in India, DDT is continued. And uh, in uh, your in third discussion, you have mentioned that uh, environmental contamination due to parathroids. So uh, these parathroids disintegrate uh, themselves uh, within six to uh, months to one year. DT is the um, insecticide which prolongs, it remains in the environment, in, it contaminates in, uh, environment more than parathroids. So uh, parathroids are uh, well safe and uh, even uh, the um, uh, mammal uh, toxicity uh, for this insecticide is very low uh, in comparison to DT. So parathroids might be uh, continued, no problem. No, but actually even if you look at uh, one of the interesting things that I felt was when we talk about the ecological vector management, which just used lime and mud, the the level of reduction that was seen was also relatively, you can say, comparable with what was seen with the, the bed nets, which I thought was quite interesting. But I don't have more detail on what kind of effect it has, whether it is toxic in any way to them or it's reducing their numbers, but um, they had shown reduction in sand fly densities, which were in one study comparable with the um, insecticide treated nets, which I thought was interesting. Uh, yes, I will supplement. Uh, yes. Actually, uh, you, uh, you are mentioning the paper about Josie. In that Josie, uh, it has been mentioned that lime is able to uh, reduce the density. Yeah. But uh, even in my recent paper, which I have presented uh, this morning, uh, the lime uh, is not better than others. Means uh, it was uh, not able to reduce the density for long period. For first follow-up, one month, it was able to reduce the density significantly, but uh, even in the first month, uh, the other methods were uh, able to reduce the, uh, highly significant. So after three months and six months, the uh, uh, lime has uh, less reduction. So it is natural that uh, we are plastering our houses with cow dung, and uh, that is the uh, um, correction of the crevices in the houses, so that they reduce the breeding sites of sand fly not they kill the things. Uh, about repellency, there was one question about repellency, uh, we can use the repellent uh, to repel the vectors, that is right. So what happens that there is one paper from India and they have published that uh, they have reported sand flies on the uh, palm tree and uh, other outside the things. So to check uh, those things, findings in Nepal, I had to use um, 50 and more than 50 light traps on coconut uh, trees, um, uh, this uh, banana trees, and all trees, but we were unable to report a single vector species on them. So it is the effect of repellency, means uh, we are using uh, parathroids uh, in Nepal. So what happens those vectors which are going to sit there, they are killed. But in India, they are using DAT, so they are repelled outside from inside. So they have gone to forest and other, other <coughs> trees, but they, are not, they have not been reported from Nepal. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to the next paper. Uh, it is by Professor Marlene Bullard. Uh, she is a professor and head of the Department of Public Health at the Institute of Tropical Medicine, and she will be presenting leishmaniasis after initial cure with miltefusin in India and Nepal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, good morning. I'm presenting on behalf of Bart Austin, who would have liked to be here, who sent his regards to the... and to you. And um, this is work, so we shift from vector control to clinical management of Calazar cases. Failure of miltefusin treatment for Calazar in children and men in Southeast Asia. Miltefusin is, it was said yesterday, is the current, st still the current um, first line drug used, but the elimination initiative is reconsidering that. Miltefusin is an, an oral anti-cancer drug. It, uh, it is teratogenic. But the um, very good news um, that was brought, I remember, 
in the Congress in Liverpool uh, long ago, that this was a breakthrough because it had an anti leishmanial effect. And th this molecule was put into clinical research programs and is thanks to the work of Professor Shaim Sundar and his teams, other teams in India, that this clinical development led to an effectiveness estimate that 94% of Kalaza cases were cured with this oral drug. And that is major because so far the antimonials, this was a long painful treatment by injectable drugs. So at that time, that in, uh, the, the governments of India, Nepal and Bangladesh use that actually also as a basis for the elimination initiative because they said we have now the technological advance, we have a drug that is more easy to use, effective oral drug, and in, that was the basis also we could control and eliminate this disease below public health levels of importance. So, Imiltefacin has to be taken um, for 28 days. Yeah, sorry, I'm a bit struggling. Yeah, here. Okay, I have this. For 28 days, and the dosages are here. Adults, um, if they weigh below 25 kg, need to, need to take one capsule. Be above 25, they need to take two capsules a day. And in children, the dosage is um, based on the weight, 2.5 milligram per kg. So. <clears throat> this was decided in 2005, the, however, the rollout in practice took some time and in 2008, for instance, um, a survey showed that still in the primary healthcare centers, 50% of the patients were still treated with antimonials at that time. So between the day you decide to change the drug policy and the day that effectively covers all the patients, there is some gap, we know that. <clears throat> so, I, I use this slide, it's unreadable, but uh, Professor Shaim Sundar um, was involved in most of these uh, studies, so he knows all these data as well. It is just to show that there was extensive clinical research done on this molecule. And so this decision to, to take it on as a first-line drug was based on yeah, the standard uh, approach, but also on studies in children, pediatric studies. And what is remarkable, so the, <clears throat> how does this pointer work? That is another issue. Actually, it's better, yeah, here, okay. So the 94% uh, cure rate is here. That is the phase three study. But typically with the development of a drug, after it's put on the market, if you do later research, you, you do studies that include a larger spectrum of patients than in the, yeah, it's gone again, yeah. Oh. Oh, sorry, I'm very bad on this PowerPoint, so I'm very sorry. So uh, <clears throat> let me go, go back again. So uh, you, you can't see it, but in the phase four studies where that included more children, there you saw already that actually the cure rates were lower. So 81.9% in Bhattacharya studies and Raman 71%. Uh, so the phase four. In the phase four, there are already also other uh, differences. So, but that was all one issue. So, miltefacin, the program is very much aware that this drug has a long half-life. So, there, there were warnings from the, the, the community, the parasitologists and the clinical pharmacologists that there might be potential for drug resistance. So a, a big project was set up to do actually surveillance on this clinical outcome monitoring in the same way the tuberculosis program monitors clinical outcomes by retrospective quarterly cohort monitoring. So this RQCM um, method was done and it was done in the tertiary care centers 
in India and in Nepal, but also at primary care level, and I will come back to that. So in the tertiary care centers, um, in India, it, in, in Professor Shyam's center, it showed a 90% cure rate. So compared to the 94% cure rates that were observed one decade earlier in the phase three trial, there is already a decrease and was a significant decrease. In Nepal, another remarkable finding was found that the in, well, initial cure rate is, is just at end of treatment, but the relapse month at six months, which is the standard um, endpoint, was 10%, but if they continue to follow the patients, the relapses were more, and so cumulatively after one year, you had a 20% relapse rate. So 20% of the patients came back with uh, a relapse of Calazar. So why, why is that? Are, what are the reasons? And there can be many reasons. Can be patient adherence, could be reinfection, and could be, so these issues were addressed in separate studies. And we had a discussion yesterday about is there reinfection or relapse? So as uh, Professor, Professor Rijal yesterday explained, there was molecular biology done on samples and there are no arguments for reinfection. And anyway, a 20% relapse rate, that is not the same, there is not a 20% annual incidence rate in, of Calas, there are no way that the incidence rates are so high. So it is relapse that we are pretty sure. So other factors were also looked at. Um, <clears throat> so we, to understand better what was happening, we pulled the data of these tertiary care centers with data from the primary healthcare centers, which you could say, yeah, that is less clean, of course, because in the, in the real context of the primary healthcare center, um, yes, the, the actual, um, the actual measurements are maybe less of less quality. Also, the the observance of treatment might be different from the tertiary care centers. So we thought, well, but we pulled the data which were available, and you saw them. So the KMRC is the Kalazar Medical Center of Professor Sundar in Muzaffarpur, and there were three primary healthcare centers in the district of Muzaffarpur. So in Nepal, again, you had BPKHS data, but also data from the district hospitals. So um, multivariable analysis was done, survival analysis, and we looked at was there a difference in the cases who relapsed compared to the patients who were cured on their clinical characteristics. So, <clears throat> This data again just show the complexity also of uh, this type of uh, study and analysis. But what is um, interesting to see is, well, I don't understand why this, this thing. Can you help me to, with the pointer, please, to, to show me how this works? I should have known. Okay, thank you, sorry for that. So, a TB program would look at data as of this in terms of standard indicators. And a TB program would talk in terms of completion of treatment. Have, you, have the patients taken the pills? At the end of treatment, instead of talking about initial cure rates, they would just say, okay, they have taken the treatment and they are well. So, there is not, not a big problem there. Except, yeah, in the zone of hospitals, you see there were yeah, more people who did not complete the treatment. So we, for several reasons. So the main indicator in a TB program would be the cure rate at six months, eh, because that is standardly known. And there, <clears throat> you see that, again, there were lots to follow ups and there were a high number of them in the district hospitals in Nepal. So where we are without information. This leads to, for a TB program to a very low cure rate eh, as an, an indicator of, of effectiveness. 
if you would look at it like a like a program in a TV program mode. But <clears throat> so there we can discuss a long time of what is the relevance. It is not easy in a Kalazar uh, control program to to in insert also a way of measuring the clinical outcomes eh, because of the complexity. In TB, the patients, they, they stay in treatment eh, for that period of several months, but here, after they have taken the last pill of miltefacin, they go home and they are actually asked to come back. So that is an effort of the patient. So it's not easy to obtain, yeah, there I go again, to obtain those endpoints um, in, um, in, a, in a routine setting. Okay. But what is the point of um, this presentation is that the relapses in, if you take them combined uh, across these two contexts, then you, you get to 78 relapses and 775 people who were cured um, at the end of observation. Okay. So when we looked, that is what I promised, we compared their clinical characteristics and we looked at gender, at age, at whether they had been treated before, at the duration of their symptoms, because you can imagine that those who come late and, and have advanced stages of disease, they might be more at risk for relapse. Whether <clears throat> the spleen size on admission is also uh, a same indicator of the, of the duration of disease and whether they had reported side effects during the treatment or not, because maybe they had stopped uh, taking the pills, and whether the children were treated with appropriate uh, pediatric tablets or not, because it's not easy to, to split a 50 milligram capsule in appropriate dosages. So, well, if you look at this more bivariate analysis, but it was controlled for treatment facility, there you, you, we pick up only two signals there. That is the gender, yeah, because the, the male actually relapsed more than the female, and the age, and that is what we pick out of, of this analysis. <clears throat> and you see that it is the children who relapse more, and it are the, the male. So in a multivariate analysis, this was confirmed. So male had twice as much risk of relapsing than female, and especially the small children had that risk. <clears throat> so yeah, this graph shows it uh, for age. Be, 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 care be careful because the axis does not start from zero there, but to, sh to be able to show the differences. So our conclusions, given that we have observed this increasing failure rate, 20% of patients failing in, in Nepal, that is really worrying. Given also, and the important fact, that the laboratory analysis did not show parasitological resistance, that is the key factor, of course. And so we could not show so far parasitological resistance. So if it's not the parasite, so what is it then? So then in, in our analysis, we included a clinical pharmacologist, Thomas Dorlo, who also looked at this in an analysis of um, um, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic modeling. Don't ask me uh, the, the details of that. So they, based on the available data, they suggest that there might be a problem of under exposure of the children to the drug, so that somehow the, ch the dosage the children receive is not right, and that it should be looked into, okay? So that is uh, one yeah, message, and it is, I think, more generally a problem in neglected tropical diseases. It is good to encourage more clinical research. We need better drugs. And it's clear that it's very difficult, but we need also data from children because visceral leishmaniasis is a pediatric disease in many places. So there should be enough data on children. <clears throat> so I thank the, the consortium and all the people who contributed to this work from the Kala Drug Consortium, which was funded by the European Union, and of course the patients and the clinic staff from all the uh, study centers. Thank you.
Thank, thank you, Marlene. So from your paper, uh, two points emerge very uh, importantly. One, number one is it is very striking that w how we cross the border, uh, say, between India and Nepal and Bangladesh, uh, there is so much difference in the efficacy of the drug. This is number one. And number two, in children, we are probably <coughs> underdosing them, I mean, as you have said. But the problem with miltifosin is that the therapeutic window is very narrow. So the moment you go above 4 milligram, the toxicity is appear. So probably initially when it was uh, planned, uh, a higher dose could have been, or a dose ranging could have been done in a much wider way, as you have suggested now, for future. So, but it is really intriguing why, why in three countries we are getting such different results. Indeed, thank you for that comment. I must give some more contextual factors also. The, it's clear that, for instance, also the patient cohorts uh, in the teaching or in the tertiary care centers, so between KMRC in India and BPKHS in Nepal, uh, there is a difference, uh, and, and we have always been very transparent about that in your center, the patient stayed in hospital for the full duration. So they took the tablets directly observed in the center. Whereas in, in Nepal, the patients could go home with their supply for one week uh, and take it at home and come back. Okay. That is already a difference at that level. But that was also looked into because you rightfully asked the question, is there a difference in adherence? Maybe in Nepal, the patients had not taken the pills. And one thing is giving it out. Another thing is, do they really take it? So there was a separate study on adherence done in Nepal, and also it was looked at um, by Thomas Dorlo eh, with, uh, in the samples, what the miltifosin levels were, and there was no evidence that patients would ha not have taken the pills in Nepal. Eh? So there we are relatively sure that, yeah, although the difference is there, that um, it's not the explanation. They had taken the pills, and anyway, if you find a 20% failure rate in a cohort in Nepal, in a teaching hospital, your program is not going to do better. Eh? The so the program is not able eh, to put uh, all the patients to 28 days with an oral drug in hospital, because then you lose also the advantage of the oral drug. So it is very worrying to observe 20% failure. So it's indeed, you, you need to look into these issues and I think the very, the, the very, what I'm very glad about that is over the past decade that uh, your teams have so much invested in this and are so looking at all these levels and even after yeah, the drug is developed to continue monitoring by pharmacovigilance and monitoring of clinical outcomes is very important. But translating it then, that is also the difficult thing we saw with the vector uh, intervention studies. It is not easy this translation to policy step is a difficult one. What is the meaning now of what we saw? Should they immediately shift to something else? No, you can't do that because to, to, to make the shift from antimonials to miltefusin, it took four years in India or more even. Huh? No, it took a long time. So the health system cannot immediately jump at every finding. Huh? But it is very important and I know that the the way the drug policy is formulated depends on technical advisory groups who look at these research data and who take these signals very seriously. And indeed, since a long time, we knew that the answer is not in increasing the dose of miltofusin in monotherapy. No, since a long time, we know either we go for single shot, shot ambizone or combination therapies, which have been developed as well, would be a better approach to address these issues because they would protect also for future resistance. So Thank you. I would, uh, I would also like to supplement, uh, you know, we had done uh, another study as you have seen the data, Dr. Professor Sundar, you know, on 2004-05. And that time when your phase four was, in India, was ongoing, 
So we were also involved in another small cohort at that time, 125 Kalaza patients. And there also we had seen about 10 to 13 percent relapse at six months, which was quite different from what India had experienced. So this is not the first time which we have found this uh, high relapse in Nepal. And, and I, I must say that I, don't, I cannot really explain uh, why, why we are seeing this difference. Uh, another question which uh, probably is observation, I would say, not a question, is uh, there is, seems to be a difference in the way you have failure with treatment with antimonials compared to miltifosin. Antimonials, they tend to fail at the end of therapy, you know, it's, it's uh, usually, uh, you know, they are, most of them, but they don't react, uh, they, they fail at the end of the treatment. But miltifosin, we see almost 100% unless they develop a side effect, they uh, respond to the treatment and they have an initial cure, but then they come with relapse. So there seems to be some things which we are not able to understand why you are having a difference in this type of, uh, you know, it's quite different the way they fail. So these are things which we still don't know the true reasons. Good morning. I'm Dr. Nadi Gup from Himachal Pradesh Health Services. I'm pr presently pursuing MPH from National Institute of Epidemiology. Uh, very informative and relevant presentation, madam. Uh, what do you consider as a treatment completion with miltifosin? Because it has to be taken for 28 days and sometimes twice daily uh, because we are planning a study for adherence. What would be considered as treatment completed? It would be a sharp 28 days or it would be more, how much can we go further? to say that it is treatment completed with miltifosin. Thank you. Yes, how much tolerance can you have there? Yeah, I can you, yeah. So we actually looked at whether they had taken the 28 days of the, of the, of the treatment, but in the adherence study, and you can discuss with Mr. Surendra Uran, who is there in the room behind you, and he did that adherence study, and there he, it was defined, patient was adherent if they had taken 25 tablet, uh, capsules, huh? 25? 90% of all capsules taken. Yeah? That was operationally defined as adherence. So but I would suggest that you go and discuss with him. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> I just have a question, Marlene. <coughs> Ah, Deva, hello. Yeah. No, one, uh, you're talking about three different sites, three different results in terms of relapse. But what about the uh, quality of the medicine used? Is it the same uh, medicine uh, used in all the three areas, or is it different companies uh, producing it? Because active ingredient produced also could be variable, especially in India, we know that there are a lot of spurious drugs on the market. Yeah. So, Thank you very much for that question indeed, because I didn't say that, but in, this is a research setting where all the patients were treated with branded drugs, Impavido, important, quality assured, checked. We actually took samples from the batches we received and had them cross-checked again. So we are pretty sure that the, the drug the patients took was um, effective, efficacious. But you rightly pointed out, because in Bangladesh, they have had a major problem with uh, locally manufactured miltefosin that simply did not contain any active, any API, there was no drug in it. And they, they observed it because there were, patients were dying, so they, yeah, there was an analysis set up, and it was discovered that actually something was seriously wrong and that, uh, that is also, that data is available in the literature. You, you, you can read more about that. But it's, it's a very important uh, comment. Thank you. My name is Dr. Nadal Gunyev from Palestine. According to the, your study, uh, you have 6% uh, patients having uh, side effect. Do you know, is there any relationship between the, those who are having a side effect and their relapse status? Thank you. Yeah, good question. 
No, there was not, and that is my <clears throat> my big table, which is not readable, so I don't recommend that you make presentations like this. So, there wa this was, well, even the people who reported side effects during the treatment, 6.5% um, of them relapsed. So they relapsed less than the ones that did not report. But there is a small difference, but it's not significant, and it actually goes in the other direction. Okay, so that was not the, the reason. But it's true that miltefacin and Professor Sunda can really explain more. It's not an, it's not, it's an oral drug, okay, but it isn't, you know, an, from oncology. So it has a lot of side effects, vomiting. So it's not the most easy drug to handle. Eh? So that is also why we still need innovation in this field and continuing innovation in clinical research because we were very glad when it, when it came there, miltefacin, but it's clearly not a drug that I would call adapted or appropriate for use in primary healthcare settings because of these major side effects of vomiting. Yeah, I think you are very right. And you should remember when miltefusin was introduced, there was no option but amphotericin deoxycholate, and which is another very horrible uh, treatment if uh, being given. So at that time, but now we definitely have better drugs, and with the combinations, as Marlin already suggested, we might be able to reduce the duration of treatment to one day or a week, and uh, otherwise this drug actually is not very well tolerated, as she has already said. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. My name is Guy Kegels from the Institute of Tropical Medicine. Um, I'm not hindered by any expertise on Kali Azar, eh? but um, I have a little bit of a deja vu. If, if you look at how TB treatment was developed in the, in the early days, actually people were cured or considered to be cured after two to three months. But it was decided very quickly to prolong the treatment over a much longer period of time because there were unacceptable relapse rates. So my question would be, but I think it has been already answered partially by the, la by the latest exchanges. <laughs> it seems to be a very, a very toxic drug, actually. But the, the logical, if, if you pick the parallel with TB, the logical conclusion would be, okay, prolong the treatment. Why, why stop it at 28 days? I think I understand now why. But maybe a repetition of the drug after a couple of months might be another solution. I don't know if that ever crossed uh, your mind. So you say a repeat course? Yes. Yeah. You would <laughs> the Actually, um, Miltofacin is not recommended to be uh, uh, repeated because most of the time these patients when they relapse they are treated either with ambisome or um, amphotericin B deoxycholate. Uh, so and in one of the studies that uh, soon will be presented you will see that it's some amount of tolerance also develops. And uh, so um, tolerance by parasites. So, uh, most of the relapses are treated either with amphotericin B deoxycholate or with ambisome. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Amrita Sarkar. I just wanted to know, ma'am, uh, is there a specific cause why uh, males are getting relapses more than females? Thank you for that question. We had that yesterday also when the uh, team from MSF presented the data, but that was on ambisome. Eh? They also saw that male relapsed more than female. Now, there is also a biological, a possible biological explanation for that. Of course, we think all, we all think about um, behavior and, and gender biases, uh, women not seeking care in the same way, but this is, relapse okay so this is not about new infections so they are n it's not about their exposure eh? so it's the parasite they contracted in the first place 
but the biological explanation might be, uh, but I have no proof for that, is to point to a study that was done in Colombia by Nancy Saravia, so you, I can give you the reference later, that showed in mice studies, uh, where in a very controlled laboratory environment, that when they experimentally infected these mice with the parasite, and they compared then what happened in the female mice and the male mice, it was clear that the male mice, they had higher mortality, yes, more, more serious progression than the female mice. And they linked that directly to the immune uh, pathogenicity that is different in male related to hormonal balances and so on. So that might be a possible explanation. Eh? We should not discard biology totally. Eh? So, and at least in one field, we can think that we are stronger. <laughs> That's thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marlene. I think we need to break. And uh, we'll have a tea break now for 15 minutes. And kindly come back at 11.25. Uh, dear delegates, I'd just like to make a couple of announcements. Uh, firstly, I request all of you to please fill out the feedback form, which is placed at the center of each table. It is titled Session 4, and uh, we'll collect it uh, after th at the end of this session. Secondly, uh, just at the entrance of, the, of this hall, we have a, a travel support desk, and I request all the delegates to provide their required documents for the travel re reimbursements to this desk. Also, uh, the delegates who are leaving today, I request you to kindly confirm the departure timing with the uh, support team over there, so that if there are any changes, we could make the required arrangements. Thank you.